I think we're going to see in this meeting lots of, lots of figures, lots of statistics on cancer, what's important. This is the pre-conference booklet and you see page one covered in data on cancer around the world. So what I'm going to say is a little bit about, uh, it seems very easy this data, it's all there on the internet. Where does it come from? And uh, who's paying for all this stuff in the end? So anyway, just some generalities first. The, uh, of course, we need information on cancer, that's quite clear. Both for planning of, planning of cancer services, monitoring how we're getting on, and also for research to tell us what are the priorities. Shouldn't just be doing research for the sake of answering an interesting question unless it's relevant to an actual problem. So I think the, the need for this sort of data is apparent. And there we are, this is the sort of material we have. It's the, the technical terms we've already heard, incidence of cancer, mortality, and a few other metrics we can use, person years of life and so on. Survival and then prevalence, how many survivors are alive with cancer. So it's now, I don't know, 25 years or something since we started this business of making global estimates. That's the first, first paper that came out, I think, about 30 years ago, something like that. And since then, there have been a series of these estimates of the numbers and rates of cancer around the world. The latest one that's been published is 2012. Here it is, it's this so-called Global Can. The name was meant as a sort of joke at the beginning, but it stuck. This is the most recent one that you can find on the internet at the moment, Global Can 2012. It's a set of estimates of incidence, mortality and prevalence for every country in the world, for 27 types of cancers, it says there. Now, they, those, those, uh, it's Global Can 2012, it, it came out in about four years ago, using data up to about 2013, so it's a little, bit, a little bit out of date now. And this year, a new set of estimates will appear, Global Can 2018, to which Sharon was referring. It's more cancers this time, added in a few more. And this time, because we're constantly being nagged about this, uh, there should be some sort of estimate of uh, what's the uncertainty around these figures. Actually, it's very difficult to say. It's not, a, not an issue of statistical confidence intervals. It's also an issue of the, of the quality and certainty of the data. But anyway, there's going to be some sort of estimate of how certain these numbers actually are. But the bad news is that this is going to be launched in September by the director of IARC, who retires this year, and he wants to do it in person, so I've been told I can't tell you the new numbers. But you may get a few hints from what I'm about to say. But anyway, just to tell you, where does all this material come from? It seems very easy. We click on the internet thing and download a few pictures for our papers. But I think it does well just to reflect for a while, where are we getting all this information? Anyway, Global Can, one essential thing is that, I think this is a really important point, that all those figures that we see, they are based on actual data coming from these different countries. They're not just estimates based on, uh, well, we think at this level of development, so many cancers ought to be present, uh, as we find in some other uh, famous uh, organizations that produce world estimates of different diseases. Globacan is based on real data coming, being collected by people around the world. The mortality data, of course, is coming from vital registration, and the incidence data from population-based cancer registries. And as I'm going to show you, for low- and middle-income countries who don't have national vital statistics systems, the population-based registries are, are particularly important. And of course, when you see the estimates for 2018, of course, they're not really based on data from 2018. They're on the most recent incidence rates available uh, using the population estimates for 2018. So the data themselves are a little bit older, but nevertheless it will be the best guess possible of the numbers of cases, deaths and so on in 2018. So where does the cancer incidence data come from? Well, it's, it's done in a sort of sequence. We choose for each country the best data possible from a high quality cancer registry, a national one if we've got it. If it's not, it's regional registries. And then coming down to the very lowest level 
Failing all else, we're just uh, getting some information in the population concerned, what's the relative frequency of different cancers, even if we don't have the incidence rates themselves. For mortality, of course, it should be from national vital statistics. But for most lower and middle income countries, we don't have national vital statistics systems, so we estimate the number of deaths based on the incidence and survival. Okay, it should be easy if we know the two. But what happens if there's no survival data either? Then we have to make an estimate of what's the likely survival from, country, from cancer in different countries. Based on these sort of models that we set up, here we are, it's the, on, on the left-hand side, it's the actual data from uh, different countries at different levels of development based on the based on the Human Development Index, and a few low- and middle-income countries for which we have survival. And then we can try to predict what the likely survival of cancer is in, in different circumstances and, and estimate mortality that way. So here we are. Here's the, here's the global estimates. 2012, I think everybody's used to citing this figure, 14 million new cancer cases, sl slightly over half in low- and middle-income countries. 2018, I can't tell you, but you can see it's slightly more. And as we've heard before, this is the estimates for the future. 2035, based on those most recent estimates, 2018 estimates, there will be something like a 24 million, quite a big increase, and still a shift to what we now call lower middle income countries. Who knows what the situation will be like in, in, in another 20 years. But this, this uh, tilt of cancer cases to what's currently called low- and middle-income countries will continue. And more striking, I think, is this, this one. The green sections on these discs relates to people over 65. I don't know if you call them elderly. But anyway, look at the, uh, look at the, look at the position by, by 20, uh, 2035, the proportion in the elderly. I can't read the number from here. 57% will be in people over 65. Now... This is the keynote figure, I think. This is from Globacan 2012, showing what are the most common cancers in the world. Blue is in incidence, red in mortality, males and females. And just ranking them by the number of cases. So number one at the time was lung. And number two, you can see the length of the blue bar is pretty much the same, breast cancer, but only in females. The colorectum, large bowel cancer, prostate, and stomach, that was the order of the first five. And I can reveal <laughs> that in 2018, that order won't have changed, although the, the numbers have changed somewhat. The, the differences between them are somewhat different. Okay, knowing you won't be able to take it all in, this is actually some data from the latest estimates, looking at what's the most common cancer in each country, in men and women. So in men, it's quite a patchwork, the top... The top map is the most common cancer in each country of the world in men, dominated by green. The light green is lung cancer. So you can see that's more or less the Middle East and Central Asia. The dark green is prostate cancer, all of the Americas, and a large chunk of Sub-Saharan Africa, a prostate cancer, the most common cancer of men, as it is in Western Europe, as we see. So that's come to be really the dominant cancer of men. And in women, the picture is really amazing. Really only, apart from a couple of countries, really only two cancers most common. The blue, the biggest number now is breast cancer. So it's the number one for practically all the countries, except for a few countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and you can see one cancer in one country in Latin America where cervix cancer is still the number one. So that's been a bit of a change. Breast cancer gradually coming to dominate the scene. Now, lots of figures, where does it all come from? This is the World Health Assembly resolution on cancer prevention and control. And in amongst the resolutions of health ministers, they're telling WHO, okay, it's all very well to tell them, that they have to put some money on cancer surveillance and in particular, do something about population-based cancer registries. That's all very well, but who's going to pay for this? It's all very well to say you must do it. Health ministers can sit around in Geneva for a week and come up with resolutions, but in the end, uh, somebody's got to implement them. Well, are they going to do it themselves? It's not very likely. First of all, I think we know very well, is cancer a priority? It is for this country and for many countries. Here we are, here's a little chart of uh, what 
amount spent per head of population on health. I got this from the UNDP website. And you can see Sweden up there amongst the top. Amazingly enough, Norway comes out number one. The spending on health per head of population, it's thousands of dollars. But look down the bottom there, some of these countries, just a few tens of dollars per head of population. How is cancer going to be a priority amongst all the other issues? And if cancer's a priority, what about cancer registration? Who's, who's going to pay for that? Well, what about research? Should, somebody should be doing something. What about local academia? Are local universities going to be able to support this sort of activity? What about, what about academic institutions in, in high-income countries? Are they going to support the actual collection and processing of data on cancer? Well, I think you're familiar with these sort of figures. This is, this is, I took this from the, the Cancer Atlas, which you may know. It's just looking at the numbers of publications in different countries according to level of development. And uh, as you move to the right, higher-income countries, that's where all the cancer research is being done at the moment. And what is cancer research being spent on? Well, the two segments there, the two brown segments, are research on basic cause and treatment. So very little on practicalities of, of cancer control, cancer care, cancer prevention, and so on. And it says in this atlas, I don't know if it's true, only about 2.7% of global cancer investment is research directly relevant to low- and middle-income countries, and that includes just the simple basics of data collection. So what about international donors? Well, I think, I think most of us know who work in this field that up until recently, they've really been focused on, on the low-hanging fruit, maternal and child health, infectious diseases, AIDS, malaria, and so on. Difficult problems in themselves, but solvable. And cancer hasn't been a problem for international donors, with, of course, I suppose the exception of the International Agency of Research on Cancer, where I should declare an interest. I work there as a, a visiting scientist. Yes, it's their mission to do something about this. This is a very small organization with a, a tiny budget compared with most donor organizations. But they do attempt to do something about this issue. There is a program now called the Global Initiative for Cancer Registry Development. That's what the little uh, sign is down the bottom, realizing that there is a need for good data on cancer, that there's huge inequalities. Not, of course, cancer data is only one example of the inequalities of, of cancer care and control. But uh, they have to do something about it, and this is the program that GIC have set up, partly in response to these health resolutions that something should be done about cancer information. And here's our small contribution from Africa. It's what we call the African Cancer Registry Network. It's a, it's a consortium of all the existing cancer registries in Africa at the moment. Now, I think in the WHO African region, there are 47 countries. And for all of that, at the moment, there are only 30 functioning cancer registries for only half the countries. So it's, it's, not an, it's far from ideal situation, far from ideal. But what are we to do about it? Well, we do as best we can with what money we can raise. I think these are the two organizations that are directly involved in the network. International agency that gives a, a small contract every year to help these registries, and INCTR for whom this is a, a program. But we've also, I should acknowledge the other donors. Now, a couple, there's a cancer charity and a, and, a, and a pharmaceutical company there, which have donated generally to, generously to this work over the last five years, and then a variety of other donors uh, that have helped us out. American Cancer Society and one or two other pharmaceutical companies that have given money to, to support this. So there we are. Just remember when you click on this data on the internet that somebody's collecting this at a lot of pain and expense in difficult circumstances with very little support. Thank you very much. I could see our chairman's got up. <laughs> I'll leave this here. Sir. No, you can stay. Thank you. Okay. Very interesting. Any comments or Questions for, Mark, for Max. Uh, we have some um, microphones out in the audience. Um, if you could just give uh, the lady in the middle. I have two questions there. You can share one microphone, maybe. 
And meanwhile, while they're getting the microphones ready, I want to ask you, you said that in 2018, which is very secret uh, already, there's not such a big difference between number one and number two, between lung and breast cancer. Or will they be on the same level? <laughs> well, I can't tell you because if I tell you and it gets into the paper, I'll be really in trouble. But with we will all people. not <laughs> say anything. It's I promise that there's Chatham certain... rules. Anyway, what well, I can say that those, the ranking there hasn't changed. But as you might expect, as you might expect, I think lung cancer. Okay, it's been a huge problem, but in a, I think a lot of Western countries actually declining. I think, as you know. It's not the case everywhere, but that, it's, it's not as if it's going up everywhere. Breast cancer is a different story. The incidence of breast cancer, really, only in a few countries as it sort of plateaued, and most low-income countries, it's rising quite quickly. So it's not surprising to see the gap between them is, is narrowing. You could see, I could say that it hasn't overtaken breast can lung cancer, yet, as far as we can see from the figures, but there's a margin of error. And we, when we see what the error margin is, it, probably it's hard to say which is the most common. But it's really, I think it's easy to guess that the margin will certainly have decreased. Yes, please. So uh, the Globocan is for the adult uh, population only. Are there plans to expand Globocan also to include children? <laughs> you know, you're quite right. The, it says 36 cancers, but of course they're cancers as defined by the ICD-10. Breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate, and so on. And of course that doesn't really suit childhood cancers at all. And they've talked about this for many years to produce a sort of global kid that would use the information we have on incidence of childhood cancer and produce some proper estimates. All I can say is I know that people at IARC are very keen to do this, and it's been a project that they've been wanting to do for years, but haven't. But they really should. You're quite right. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite unsuitable for children. You can't really tease out how many retin. You can have a sort of stab, but it's really not adapted to children at all. All the eight, I think the 0 to 15 age group is lumped together, and it's really hard to figure out what's going on. So you're quite right. So it, they want to do it. They should do it. Just keep pestering and saying, where is it? Yes, and please introduce yourself. Yes. Good morning, Mark. I'm Arun Gupta from Vinova Cancer NGO India. My question is, like Globcan is doing a database, collecting a database of ca cancers or types of cancers or cancer patients' mortality rates. As you very rightly said, the uh, economic cost of cancer is the second highest in the world. So are you also working on uh, creating a database on various initiatives that are being taken by different governments or agencies, private agencies in different parts of the world to combat these social economic costs? I mean, the short answer is no. We're, what we're concerned with is trying to make these global estimates themselves, collecting information on incidence, mortality, and so on. The issue of, does anybody know what's going on, how many organizations are dealing with cancer worldwide? Uh, pro probably not. I mean, who, who would know such a thing? I think NGOs, you might go to UICC, a lot of will be members of UICC, but over, I don't think there's a, I, I doubt there's a database, a, a global database. There might be, but I'm not aware of it. Mm. it the last little question for me. Uh, you said that 2.7% of research, I think, is relevant to low or... Uh, uh, low or uh, income countries. Um, what do you think about that? <laughs> Listen, that's a figure I took from the Global Cancer, the cancer Atlas, which you may know is online. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but one can quite believe it. I mean, when they say relevant, I think it means relevant to immediate problems, isn't it? Rather mm. than. But still, it's very concentrated. On yeah, I mean, you could say a lot of the research that we're going on on, this, on pharmaceuticals, on treatment and so on, it is ultimately relevant, but it's not going to be of immediate benefit, is it? So I think the, to say what's, what's really, really of immediate relevance to low- and middle-income countries, I think we know what it is. They're just relatively simple things. How to, I mean, the, what are the most glaring problems? Okay, apart from lack of infrastructure, a lot, of the, a lot of the problem, when there is infrastructure for treatment present, they're struggling because of issues of late presentation and so on. So I think a lot more can be done on just trying screening. to improve earlier diagnosis, one way or another. It's not always the patient's fault. Earlier diagnosis, screening, not always screening. We're always screening, always leaps to mind. We've got to have a national screening program. But just to do something about making sure that people who have symptoms of cancer, an obvious cancer, get diagnosed and treated relatively promptly. I think that would be the biggest step we could make. Not always the patient's fault, it's often the system's fault. 
people with, come with a cancer and the medical system, primary healthcare system or, or hospital system, not well adapted to recognize and doing anything about it. Once the patient has an obvious cancer and they get into the hands of oncologists, fair enough. But it's a step before that that's a bit one of the biggest problems, in my, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Max. An applause.